I don't know if you know, Pastor Marty and four of the families, uh, four of the guys in our uh, church that are on uh, in the pastor's training or at a retreat this weekend. And from all accounts, it sounds like, sounds like it was a great, uh, great time. So we uh, just pray for protection for them on the way home and uh, can't wait to hear, uh, hear all about it as we get going. Now, I don't know, it, I've done this a few times and it's just like, a, just like a basketball game or a football game or whatever you're going into. You know, you get a little anxious, you get a little nervous. Uh, and as a coach, I'd always, tell the, I'd always tell my players, I'd say, oh, that's good. You got you to be nervous. Now, you can't be such a wreck that you can't do what you're supposed to. But if you don't get, uh, if you don't get anxious or you don't get nervous, then, you know, it, sometimes, at least in my opinion, it really didn't mean anything to you. Well, I am kind of anxious. I'm kind of nervous today, even though I've done it before. Um, but the, what that tells me is that the word that I have for you today is uh, something God put on my heart. And uh, I just want to kind of share it with you today. Now, just for your information, when I practiced this, it took me about 20 minutes or so. All right? So that means it'll either be 30 minutes or it'll be 10, one of the two. So <laughs> somewhere in there, we'll, we'll try and find our range here. Um, before I start today, I, I wanted to share, there's, um, whenever I look in the Bible and I read some things in the Bible, I always, I always, I'm always amazed at some of the statements that are in the Bible, all right? Um, an example, in Daniel 3, all right, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? Nebuchadnezzar says, worship my, my idols, worship me, my idols. And in verse 17, they say, if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. And that, that, that in itself is pretty cool, standing up to the king. But in verse 18, the next five words, six words, sorry, says, but even if he does not, those words are just as amazing to me as anything. Even if he doesn't, we still won't serve your God. If you jump to Matthew in um, Matthew 16, in Matthew 16, 16, Peter says, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus had just said to him, all of his apostles, who do you say I am? And I don't know if there's any greater words spoken, spoken than what Peter spoke there. Then another example is in Acts, Peter and John, and this is kind of cool. Peter and John are in front of the Jewish leaders, and they say, you cannot say or preach or teach or do anything in the name of Jesus. And the one thing they say is, we cannot be quiet. But if you look at that, Peter and John, and here's my vision of this. Peter and John, together, it says, Peter and John together, we cannot be quiet. It's almost like um, the chant at the beginning of a ball game, you know. We cannot be quiet. There are, there are statements and there are words and, and, and things throughout the Bible that just amaze me. These are just a few examples. The one I want to talk about today. The one I want to say something about today is um, in Philippians 3. And I want to read Philippians 3, 10, 10 through 14 for you real quick. It says, better do this first so I don't mess up. Huh? It says, verse, starting in verse 10, I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. And so, somehow, attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Amen. Look at those first, those first five words in, in verse 10. I want to know Christ. Now that should be, and I hope and pray that that is, that is the one statement that all of us have in our hearts as we go forward from the time this time and now, or maybe it has been already. I want to know Christ. 
Now, I'm going to talk a little bit later on about this, but um, I've got a, as Paul says that, says that verse, verse 10, those words in verse 10, I think Paul was a little more animated than I probably was when I read that, knowing Paul. But we're going to talk about that here in just a minute. So as I was going through this, I was thinking, how can I, this, this verse, is, these verses are, are really mean a lot to me. And I wanted to try to share the best way, best ways for us to be able to share and know what Christ is in our lives. I want to know Christ. How can I do that better? All right, now, keeping in mind, I am, I am not the all-time overall authority on all this. This is just what God put on my heart. And what, ha- what, he, what he did was he, he, I got four words, four words that are going to, Help us to try to know Christ better in our lives. Those words are secure, mindful, seek, and attitude. Now, some of you may be looking at that, looking at those uh, words and going, where did those come from? How do they relate? What are they going to, how is that going to mean anything? Well, hopefully uh, over the next few minutes I'll be able to uh, share some of the things of where I got those and where I came from. Now, as I was going through all of this, I was looking at different translations, and I found a translation, um, you know, you got your Bible app and your Gateway Bible and all those things on the Internet. I was looking through all the different translations, and, I, and on your Bible apps on your phone, you got the easy reading version of, your, of, your, uh, of the Bible. And I've tried to look through it and, and compare them and And so I'm jumping back and forth a little bit between NIV and and the easy reading version because I I saw some of the things that uh, the easy reading version just said, and it it spoke more to my heart. So that's kind of where I'm going with that. In fact, the first word, secure. Here's where I get out of secure. Be secure in Jesus. All right, if you look at uh, verse 10 again, he says, and this is the easy reading version. It says, all I want to know... All I want is to know Christ and the power that raised him from death. I want to share in his sufferings and be like him even in death. And as I started to look through those, and I, I read that, and I thought, man, that really, that really speaks some things to me right there. The first part, all I want to know, all I want is to know Christ and the power that raised him from death. All right? So I got two parts to this, secure, all right? If you want to be secure in Jesus, you need to be anchored in Jesus, anchored in Jesus. Um, look at he, if you look at Hebrews 6, 19 and 20, it says, this hope is like an anchor for us. It is strong and sure and keeps us safe. It goes behind the curtain. Jesus has already entered there and opened the way for us. He is like an anchor for us. He is the anchor for us. If we are anchored in Him, we are secure in Him. And then as you look at uh, the second part of that, it says, I want to share in His sufferings and be like Him even unto death. If we are going to be secure in Jesus, we need to be anchored in Jesus, and we need to be like Him. You jump to Ephesians, and, I'm, and I know I'm going through these quickly. I, I have them on the, I wrote them out on the uh, insert for the thing, on, for the bulletin. So if you want them, you got, you got them there. But um, Ephesians 4, 22 into 24. It says, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being uh, corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self created to be like God. In true righteousness and holiness. In true righteousness and holiness. Be like God. All right, my question to you is, are you anchored in Jesus? Are you secure in that anchor? Are you acting like him? When you serve, do you serve like Jesus? When you love, do you love like Jesus? Whatever you do, whenever you do it, are you striving to be like Jesus in what you do? Those are the questions. 
If you can be secure in him in that way, that's one step towards knowing Christ a little bit better in your life. Word two was mindful. And the phrase that I want to use is be mindful of the journey God has for you. Mindful. When you hear the word mindful, what's that, what's that mean to you? To me it means, are you thinking about where your life is and the path that you're following? Verses 13 and 14 say this in Philippians, sorry, 3, 4, 13 and 14. It says, brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. When I went through there, I underlined, I underlined the words forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. What I see here is I see Paul having us or asking us to create a path. A path from point A to point B. All right? And as I look at that, forgetting what is behind tells me right there, tells me right there that this path that we're starting starts from the time that we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. We accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, and we can forget our past because we are new and being created, new creation in Him. So we start from point A to point B. Does anybody here know how, um, how do you create a path? You go over the same place time and time again. Maybe some of you can remember when you were kids. You lived in one house, your friend lived over here in another house, and you guys had always cut through the backyard to get to each other's house all, house all the time. You went over that path over and over and over and over until it was kind of worn. Maybe you rode your bikes, whatever it was you were doing at that time. You create that path. And that's a path that Paul tells us we need to start creating. Now, that path itself that we create, uh, according to Paul, needs to be the path. Not just any old path, but the path. The path that's created from point A to point B that God has shown us. Jesus has shown us, made known to us, for us and in our lives. Now, I, I couldn't help, but as I was thinking of that path and the path from point A to point B, and, and the word legacy kept, kept coming to me. That word legacy, it just kept, it kept hit, hitting me and hitting me and hitting me as I was, as I was going through this. And so I kind of related the, the word legacy to this path, all right? And walking the path from point A to point B that Paul asked us to walk is actually creating the legacy that we are going to leave for the next generations. Look at Psalm 1611. It says, You make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with the joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. So I define legacy as a way for us to share what Jesus has made known to us. That path from point A to point B. Now, when I was, I was uh, last spring I was over in Kansas City at a at a Fellowship of Christian Athletes training. And uh, during those times, we have um, uh, times where the staff over there the, of the national office lift up those that are there. And one of the messages was on legacy. And uh, Dan Bishop from, uh, from FCA, he's the national director of training, he had an inter- and it's, this quote has stuck with me. I, and it just stuck with me time and time again. So I thought I'd share it, all right? It's his, his quote said, uh, Leg- legacy is like an apple. And when he first said that sentence, he stopped and he looked at us, and everybody in there was kind of going, what are you talking about? Legacy, apple, how, how is that? But then he went on to say this. He said, you can count the number of seeds in an apple, but you cannot count the number of apples in a seed. Anybody here cuts open an apple, slices it open, takes the seeds out, and you can count how many seeds are in there? You take those seeds and you plant them. And what grows? A tree. And over the years and years and years that that tree is alive, you cannot, it's not physically possible 
to count the number of apples that come from that tree. There's no way. So how do we relate that to the legacy? Well, your path, the path that you are following from the time you accepted Christ, point A, to the time you die and go heavenward, how many seeds are you going to plant? Those seeds that you plant, how many apples will grow from the seeds you put down? There's your legacy. And what are you going to be able to do? And how are you going to be able to do that? So the question is, or the statement is, be mindful of your journey. Be conscious of what it is that you are doing. If you do that, you will get to know Christ better and better and better. Word number three was seek. Word number three was seek. And believe me, when I was, when I was going through this and working on this, I had, when I got to this section, I was, you know, I was looking at all kinds of words. And this, this is the one word that came out at me, seek. And so if that comes to me, I'm thinking, seek God. Philippians 3.14 says, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me, heavenward in Christ Jesus. Seeking God. I press on. There's a quote from, uh, I'm reading a book right now, it's called Note to Self. Uh, it's written by Jim Thorne, and he has a, has a quote in there on seeking God. It says, seeking God means that in all you do, you keep his honor in your mind, his word in your heart, and his glory as your goal. So you are seeking to actually know him and make him known. I read through that. I had to read through that several times because that just, uh, that really just kind of struck me. Seeking God is a way for us to be able to get to know Christ better. You know, you think about, I want to know Christ better. What am I going to do? All right, what do I need to do? And all the, the normal, uh, regular things come to, come to mind. You know, worship, praise, read the Bible, all of those things. And they're all, those are all have to, need to, must things to do. But in your every single day life, your, your life as you go through it day in and day out, do you seek God? Do you make a conscious effort to seek God and try to get to know Him better each and every day? You know, as you uh, break down, break down verse 14, you know, it says, I press on. That means seeking God. Toward the goal. What's the goal? Glory to God. To win the prize. What's the prize? Knowing God and to make him known. Those, those words out of verse 14 go right along with seeking God. Now here's the thing about it. It says, I press on. And if you look at the, ER, the ERV, the easy reading version, it says, running hard toward the finish line. I press on. I run hard toward the finish line. And for me, it seems like anything that has sports related, I go to right there. I just, that kind of sticks with me. I run hard toward that finish line. And by running hard toward that finish line, that point B we talked about earlier, by running hard towards that, you are assured of the final results. You know, you know you're going to win. You win no matter what happens. You win. You're running hard towards that. You know in your heart and your mind and your body that God has called you heavenward in Christ Jesus by seeking Him each and every day. Now, my last word, the last word I got here is attitude. Attitude. And my, uh, my word, the words I came up with this are have an attitude of joyful confidence. Joyful confidence. Now, I want to go back, back to verse 10. That's where, I'm going to, that's where I'm, we're going to talk about attitude. In verse 10, Paul says, I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and the participation in his sufferings and becoming like him in his death. Now, I, I kind of alluded to it a little bit earlier. I don't know about you guys, but when I look at Paul in the Bible, 
I don't look at Paul as some meek, mild uh, Christian just kind of saying the words, oh, I want to know Christ. Yes, I to know it. I, don't, I really don't, I can't envision Paul doing that. It doesn't matter whether he's uh, saying this to somebody else who's writing it down or he's writing it down or he's talking to somebody, but he's going to say, I want to know Christ. And notice the next word in that verse. Yes. Now, how do you think Paul says that? I want to know Christ. Yes. No, he's going to say, I want to know Christ. Yes. I want to know Christ. Paul didn't make any, any, um, he he didn't make any excuses. He didn't, he didn't sugarcoat anything. He said it like it was. I want to know Christ. And so I propose that we have that confidence in our attitude and make that a joyful confidence. We'll talk about uh, Paul and his joy here in just a minute, all right? But I want to give you, I just want to give you three quick examples of other, other people in the Bible that had joyful confidence. I want to go all the way back, all the way back to 2 Kings and Elisha. These three verses, uh, chapter 6, verses 15 to 17. These three verses are three of, uh, three of my, well, I got a lot of favorites. So I, can't, I, can't, I say these are my favorites, but I got a lot of favorites. But these are three that I like, all right? If you get a chance, read back through it. It says, when the servant of the man of God got up and went out early the next morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. So Elisha's servant gets up and he looks out the out the tent door and goes, and what's he say? He goes back into Elisha and he says, oh no, my Lord, what shall we do? I can just see him quivering right there. What are we going to do? All right. But in verse 16, Elisha says, don't be afraid. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And then what does Elisha do? He prays. And he says, open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looked, and he saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Can we see those horses? Can we see those chariots of fire around us each and every day? Elisha, now I don't know, when I read through these things, sometimes I envision things that I'm not sure were there, but I can, I can kind of envision Elisha uh, saying this, all right, uh, saying those who are with us are more than those who are with them and having this smile on his face to his servant because he knows, Elisha knows God. And he talks to God and God talks to him. And he knows that there's no way those guys are going to win because God is with him. And he has this big old smile on his face. And he knows that God will answer his prayers. So he has that confidence. He has an attitude of confidence. But I envision a uh, joy in the words that he's saying to his servant. My next example is that of Paul again. All right, we already talked about Paul quite a bit. But Paul has joyful confidence. If you look in, uh, right, clear back to the beginning of Philippians in, ver- in chapter 1, verses 3 through 6. He says, I thank my God every time I remember you. Talking to the Philippians as he's writing his letter. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy. Now, I, have, I don't know, but I always told my kids and my students and everybody else, be careful when you use that word always. Because that is a very distinctive, definitive word. But right here, Paul says, I always pray with joy. Because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Verse 6 says, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Paul had, from the very beginning, Paul had joyful confidence. He prays with joy. He has joy in Christ. And he's confident in what Christ is going to do for him. Some people would say, <clears throat> yeah, it's pretty easy to have that confidence and that joy when you're walking down the road to Damascus and 
Jesus flattens you down on the ground and says, here's what you're going to do. But I, I propose to you all that we can have that confidence every single day, every day of our lives. We can have that joyful confidence, the same type that Paul had, in our prayers, in our actions, in everything that we do. And my final example is, guess who? Jesus. How could I not use Jesus as an example with, of joyful confidence? If you've read through the Gospels, if you've read through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the life of Jesus, you will see in everything that Jesus does, joy and confidence. Joy and confidence. Does he have the other emotions that we've all gone through? Sure. But his attitude is that of an attitude of joyful confidence in everything that he did. If um, you look back, if you look in Hebrews, Hebrews 12, 2, uh, 2 and 3, uh, the writer of Hebrew kind of gives, uh, gives us a reminder. All right? He says, we must never stop looking to Jesus. He is the leader of our faith, and he is the one who makes our faith complete. He suffered death on a cross, but he accepted the shame of the cross as if it were nothing because of the joy he could see waiting for him. And now he is sitting at the right side of God's throne. Think about Jesus. He patiently endured the angry insults that sinful people were shouting at him. Think about him so that you won't get discouraged and stop trying. Because of the joy he could see. He had an attitude. Jesus could walk into a room and everybody, everybody knew he was there. Through the heights of his ministry, he couldn't walk through a town. He couldn't walk through a town without drawing crowds and crowds of people. But he had that joy. And I, and I think part of the other, ex, you know, except for the Holy Spirit and the divine hand of God on him throughout the whole time that he was on earth, people were drawn to him. And part of that drawing was his joy and his confidence in all that he said and he did. So I propose we need to have an attitude of joyful confidence. Four words. Secure, mindful, seek, attitude. All right? Are you secure in Jesus? Are you mindful of your journey? Are you seeking God each and every day? And do you have that attitude of joyful confidence? Keep those four things, those four things in your, in your life and I can, I can guarantee, I can guarantee that you are going to get to know Christ better. And isn't that our goal? Isn't that what we need to know? I want to know Christ. Yes. I want to know Christ. Today, as um, we're going to play some video songs for, uh, for ministry time, as we do that, and when we get ready to do that, you should always know, and those of you that are, that are regulars here, and if you're a guest here, just know that the, the cross is open to you anytime you want. You can go to the cross, you can pray, you can leave whatever you need to leave there from this week there, and, and he, will, he will take it from you. If you need somebody to pray with you, feel free to come up to the front. I would be glad to sit and pray with you. If uh, any of you here are listening to me and talking to me or, or listening to what I'm saying, and you're going, who is this Jesus that he's talking about? What is he talking about? I don't, I don't understand. The words aren't registering. They're just going right over my head. If you feel that in your heart and you feel that, that God's putting that on your heart or you can feel something weird, Maybe it's time you get to know Jesus. And if that's the case, 
I would be glad to, I'd be glad to pray with you as well. Don't put it off. None of us know what tomorrow brings. And I just, uh, I just thank you right now for the time that you let me share. And I just, uh, I just pray that, that, that all of us right now can get to know Christ a little bit better. Let's pray. Lord, we just come to you today. We all, Lord, want to know you better. We all want to do the things, Lord, that, that will allow us to get to know you each and every day of our lives. And I just pray, Lord, for each and every person here and each and every person in our, uh, in our realm of influence, Lord, that they would be able to see you in us, Lord. Allow us to be able to, to share, to come to know you, Lord, better and to make you known better to the people that are all around us. Lord, we love you, and we praise you, and we just give you glory in all that happens and all that goes on in our lives. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.